The crew is worn out. They've had 15 different major ordeals over the past couple of months, and they need some serious rest and relaxation. They find a planet that looks like it might fit the bill, but as they scout it out to make sure it's safe, a lot of weird stuff starts happening. From a giant bunny rabbit to a crazed samurai to World War II fighter planes, this planet ain't what it seems. And it's looking like it might not be the best place for shore leave. Hit it. Couple of guest stars in this episode. First, we got Emily Banks as Yo Tanya Barrows. Did the guest star circuit in such genre classics as Wild Wild West, Fantasy Island, Knight Rider, and Airwolf. Her largest role being Becky on the Tim Conway Show. Perry Lopez plays Lieutenant Rodriguez. Also did a lot of guest star appearances, but has a couple of prestigious credits on his resume as well, including films like Kelly's Heroes and Chinatown. Bruce Mars plays Finnegan. He didn't do a lot of acting, though he appears again in a later episode of Star Trek, was in two episodes each of Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea and Mission Impossible, and appeared in Time Tunnel. But he left acting in 1969 and joined the Self-Realization Fellowship, where he is known as Brother Paramananda. Yeah, didn't see that coming, did you? Finally, returning, kinda, as Angela, is Barbara Baldavin. We last saw her as the bereaved bride-to-be in Balance of Terror. Her character was originally supposed to be called Mary Teller, but someone pointed out that she's already been on the show with someone else, so they changed her character's name to Angela. Problem is, Kirk still calls her Teller at one point, so that's what we're going to call her here. But it's indicative of the chaos that this script went through in the pre-production and production phases of the episode. More on that later. But first, let's get into... The Plot. The Enterprise enters orbit of a planet, but we don't know why yet. Kirk is having problems with his back, and in a bit of wackiness, he thinks Spock is throwing a little of the old Vulcan back pinch on him, giving lots of people some fan fiction ideas, but it turns out it's Yeoman Barrows, which makes Kirk worry about HR a little bit. She mentions that he needs rest. Spock agrees, and also points out that McCoy agrees as well. Everybody's got an opinion on our captain here. Apparently, the ship has had a really bad three months, and everybody is pretty wiped out. Androids, Romulans, salt vampires, two court-martials back-to-back, it can really take it out of you, you know? Well, speaking of McCoy, he and Sulu have beamed down to the planet to see if it might be suitable for some R&R for the crew. They found the place to be perfect. No animal life, no bugs or nothing, just lush vegetation and beautiful scenery. McCoy says it's like something out of Alice in Wonderland. They're feeling like it's going to work out, but while Sulu was taking some plant samples, McCoy suddenly sees a giant friggin' bunny rabbit with a pocket watch talking about being late before hopping off. And then a girl shows up and runs after him. McCoy yells for Sulu, but Sulu didn't see shit. Up on the ship, Yeoman Barrows points out that she ain't seen Kirk's name on any of the shore leave parties, and he says he don't need rest. Spock comes in, and Kirk asks when he's beaming down to do the shore leave thing, and he says he don't need rest either, but being a Vulcan, it's a little more believable. He says when he wants to rest, he just don't use energy. Running around in a field uses energy. What sense does that make? Well, it's at this point McCoy reports to Kirk about the rabbit. Kirk rolls with it and guesses that a girl probably followed it, right? McCoy confirms. Kirk thinks he's joking and hangs up. Tells Spock it's probably a ploy to get him down there for the whole rest thing. Spock is like, yeah, probably. Oh, by the way, there's this dude who's been reportedly pretty cranky. His reaction time is getting slow. His Galaga scores are way down. All the signs of acute fatigue. But he don't want to go on shore leave. Kirk walks right into it and says he orders that guy to beam down. Rest is needed for the safety of the ship. Spock says, yeah, well, it's you. So, see ya. Well, he beams down and talks to Lieutenant Rodriguez and Ensign Angela Teller. They report on the plant life of the planet or something, and then they point Kirk to where McCoy and Sulu are hanging out. Kirk pokes fun at McCoy about the rabbit, and McCoy says, Oh, you got jokes? Well, here's a joke for you. A set of giant rabbit tracks. What do you think about that? Kirk is like, Okay, yeah, that's weird. 
So he calls up to the ship and puts shore leave on hold. McCoy says, really? Kirk is like, dude, there's supposed to be no animals down here. Now there's tracks of a six foot friggin' bunny rabbit. What else is down here? What ain't supposed to be? What are you nuts? Suddenly a gunshot rings out like a gunpowder lead splody kind of gun, you know? They find Sulu squeezing a few into the lake from what he calls an old-time police special that he just found on the ground. For some reason, finding a loaded antique earth pistol on an alien planet when it ain't even supposed to have animal life on it don't seem hinky to our boy here. Kirk confiscates the mystery pistol, the mistle, and Barrows notices more giant bunny tracks. Kirk sends her and Sulu to follow them, and he and McCoy head back to the glade. As they make their way there, we see some kind of antenna, just kind of doing that whole antenna thing. As Kirk is telling McCoy about how he was tormented while in the academy by an upperclassman named Finnegan, they notice more footprints, this time both the rabbit and the girl. They split up to follow the two tracks. As he follows Alice's tracks, Kirk stumbles onto none other than Finnegan. Not only that, it's Finnegan as he appeared in the academy. Well, Finnegan belts Kirk one and taunts him to hit him back because, quote, it's what you've always wanted to do. Huh. Weird, right? Well, before the fight is on, Kirk hears screaming and runs off to investigate while Finnegan taunts him like some kind of mental patient. McCoy heard it too, and when the pair find the source, it's Yeoman Barrows, and she's been sexually assaulted. Kirk asks who did it, and she describes him as having a cloak and a dagger with jewels. Kirk, a guy who just got decked by a dude from his academy days not 15 seconds ago, asks if she's not just imagining this, and Barrows, with a torn uniform and tears in her eyes, says, yeah, I'm pretty friggin' sure it was real. McCoy says the dude sounds like Don Juan. Barrows says she was just thinking about Don Juan before it happened. Kirk asks where Sulu went, and she says he chased after Don Juan, so Kirk goes to find him. He runs all the way to Vasquez Rocks and finds a flower he really seems to like. And just then, an old girlfriend of his, Ruth, appears. But as surprised as he is to see her, it really feels like he should be more surprised. They reminisce, and Kirk falls into a total trance and becomes a complete dunsel for a bit. Like, to naked time levels. Then Rodriguez calls Kirk on the communicator and mentions that he saw some birds, and that seems to shake Kirk out of his brain and or pants fog, and he calls for a meeting in the glade. Cut to McCoy and Barrows strolling along, and Barrows still having to hold her uniform together with her hand from the last time she pondered what a girl would want when in a fairy tale location like whatever planet this is, ponders that in a fairy tale location like whatever planet this is, a girl should be dressed as a princess. McCoy agrees and laughingly points out that whole armies of rapists would get after her if she was dressed like that, including himself. Just as Barrows is taking McCoy's statement as the uh, compliment I guess it was intended to be, she notices that there's a princess costume hanging in a nearby tree. She decides it's better than holding a ripped up uniform together all the time, and while she's putting the dress on and McCoy tries rather unsuccessfully not to watch her change, Rodriguez calls and tells him about the meeting Kirk is calling in the Glade. Also, they're hiding from a tiger, because this is apparently the kind of thing that happens now. Kirk calls Spock up on the ship to see if he's made any progress on figuring out what's going on. But it seems that communications are getting hard to maintain. As Kirk is trying to reach McCoy, Sulu blazes in saying there's a samurai after him. Doesn't seem to be the case anymore, but he tells Kirk that when he tried to stun the samurai, his phaser didn't work. Kirk tries his, and it's dead too. Right then, Spock beams in and tells them that there's been a power drain from the planet that is the cause of the communication problems, the drained phasers, and now that he's beamed down, the transporter is out too. They hear a tiger, and for some reason, Kirk wants them to spread out and find it. We'll cut to the glade where McCoy and Princess Barrows are waiting for the others, and Barrows says that she's scared. McCoy says a princess shouldn't be afraid with such a brave knight as himself to protect her. And in a plot twist even single-celled organisms could see coming a mile away, a knight on horseback shows up and runs McCoy through with a lance. Spock and Kirk arrive, and Spock tries to phaser Sir Killbones a lot over there, but his phaser's empty too. Kirk still has Dirty Sulu's revolver and shoots the knight dead. Barrows is hysterical with grief, screaming that it was her fault that McCoy got whacked. 
Kirk kind of just lets her wail for a bit and then finally helpfully and compassionately tells her to shut up and do her job. 60s. Sulu is checking out the dead knight and notes that he's fake. Looks like a mannequin. Spock takes a look with the tricorder and says that the knight has the same basic cellular structure as the plant life, indicating that the plants, trees, weird-ass people, all of it could be manufactured. Suddenly, a World War II-era fighter plane shows up. Rodriguez and Tella see it too, and he mentions that he had been telling her about them just a few minutes ago. But don't worry, they're not dangerous unless they go on a strafing run. Kind of like what it's doing right now. Well, they run for the trees, and we see a close-up of the plane, and it's a Japanese Zero. Between the Samurai and the Zero, the Japanese aren't coming off too well in this episode. Well, the Zero opens up on Rodriguez and Teller as they run to the tree line, and unfortunately, Teller gets whacked. Back in the glade, everyone is looking up at the Zero, and while they're distracted, the bodies of McCoy and the Knight have both disappeared. Spock finally puts two and two together and realizes that these strange manifestations have to do with what the person who saw them was thinking about just before they appeared. He asks what Kirk was thinking right before seeing Finnegan, and he says the Academy. Well, right on cue, Lucky O Charms over here pops out and taunts Kirk again. Kirk demands answers of the frenetic leprechaun, but he runs off. Kirk chases after him to the music of a deodorant soap commercial. Well, Kirk chases Finnegan all the way back to Vasquez Rocks. Then a 45-minute fight ensues. Kirk, of course, rips his shirt. Kirk finally knocks him out right as Spock arrives and asks him if he enjoyed the fight. Kirk says he did, and Spock says that fits with his theory. Whatever people on the planet are thinking of, the planet somehow picks up on that and manufactures those things and throws them out there for the person to interact with. But it can be dangerous, so Spock recommends that people gotta knock it off with thinking of crap that will kill your ass. Like that tiger, am I right? Well, guess what shows up immediately? Well, Kirk and Spock dodge the tiger, the Zero, and Sulu's samurai on the way back to the glade to warn everybody that they need to stop thinking all this crap up. Well, Barrows has decided the princess costume is too hot or something and has changed back into a torn uniform and returned the costume to the tree from whence it came. Just then, a dude we can only assume is Don Juan shows up like Alex DeLarge and wants another round of the old sexual violence, and Sulu and Rodriguez come to her aid. Just then, Kirk and Spock also show up, and this is apparently too much for the Don, and he runs off. Kirk tells everyone to stand at attention and don't think of nothing. No tigers, no samurais, no stay puffed marshmallow man, nothing. They do so, but Kirk don't say too much about why they're doing it. Well, this causes an old dude to show up, as you might expect. Kind of looks like Patrick McNee, this guy. Calls himself the caretaker. He knows everybody's names, too. He says they just now realize that the Enterprise crew don't get what's going on. It's an amusement park, and these experiences were for entertainment purposes only. Kirk says, well, what about the fact that McCoy is dead? That wasn't very entertaining. Well, McCoy shows up, good as new, with a new uniform and everything, and with two Vegas showgirls on his arms, and he says that they took him underground and repaired him, and he saw all of their manufacturing gear and everything. Very impressed, he says. Barrows is less than thrilled that he's only 20 minutes into their apparent relationship and is already two-timing her. Well, three-timing, actually. So Bones hands the girls off to Sulu and Spock. Exactly zero people, including Rodriguez, ask about where Teller is. Kirk questions the caretaker about his race and technology, and the caretaker tells him that humans ain't ready for that. But they're more than welcome to bring all the other crew people down and have a blast thinking up all kinds of crap to have fun with. With the proper precautions. Kirk calls up to the ship and tells Uhura to start sending people down and prepare for the best shore leave they've ever had. He mentions nothing about precautions. This should go well. Also, Teller has snuck back into the scene largely unnoticed, but no longer dead. So, that's good. Spock tells Kirk he's going to head back up to the ship. Kirk objects until Ruth shows up and he decides he's going to stick around for a few days. After an unspecified amount of time, everyone is back on the Enterprise and gathered around the captain's chair, apparently for a group photo. Spock asks if they enjoyed the shore leave. They say yes. Spock says it's illogical, and everybody laughs for a solid minute about it. The Enterprise warps out of orbit, and we roll credits. 
Great stuff. This is a fun one, with some good lines in there. On my planet, to rest is to rest, to cease using energy. To me, it is quite illogical to run up and down on green grass using energy instead of saving it. Always love Spock not being able to figure out humans. I mean, it is kind of weird that you guys love running around doing crazy things in order to relax. Possums don't do that. We do normal stuff like eating trash and pretending we're dead so we don't have to talk to our relatives. Yeah, you laugh, but you're not going to be laughing when it comes time for Thanksgiving. I picked this up uh, from Dr. McCoy's log. We have a crew member aboard who's showing signs of stress and fatigue. Reaction time down 9 to 12 percent. Associational rating norm minus three. That's much too low a rating. He's becoming irritable and quarrelsome, yet he refuses to take rest and rehabilitation. Mm -hmm. Now, he has that right, but we found... Crewman's right ends when the safety of the ship begins. Now, that man will go ashore on my orders. What's his name? James Kirk. You saw it coming, but it was still a great moment between Kirk and Spock. I like it when Spock gets a little impish with the attitude. Fear. Love. Triumph. Anything that pleases you can be made to happen. The term is amusement park. Of course. An old Earth name for a place where people could go to see and do all sorts of fascinating things. Now, Disneyland had only been open for 12 years when this episode aired. And while that's technically a theme park rather than an amusement park, you still got to think that it was on their minds when they filmed the episode. It's interesting that the concept of an amusement park seems unknown to the crew, as though Disney isn't going to have their own planet by the 23rd century, am I right? So we gave a huge welcome to Mark Leonard when he made his debut appearance in Balance of Terror, and it's time to give another big watching stuff welcome to another Star Trek All-Star, making their first appearance in this episode, and that is none other than Vasquez Rocks. 30 miles north of Los Angeles, we're going to see a lot of this place in the coming episodes. It has appeared over 13 times in all of Star Trek, most recently in Star Trek Picard as the site where Raffi has her mobile home set up on. And it's been in the likes of Bill and Ted's Bogus Journey, Blazing Saddles, Army of Darkness, The Muppet Movie, and about a million other things. IMDb has a list of almost 500 movies and TV episodes that have been filmed there, and it's one of those things where once you notice it, you start to see it everywhere. I myself have never been there, but it's on the list. And finally, as long as it is, I really do think that the Kirk and Finnegan fight is probably the best choreographed and shot fist fight in the series. It has its own progression, the characters get more and more tired as they go, the music really keeps up with the pacing of the fight, it's really well done. Where was this fight director when they were shooting Court Martial? The Goof. Okay, let me start out by saying I really do like this episode a lot. We just came off of a grim two-parter and we've dealt with a lot of heavy topics. It's fun to have a comedic episode finally, you know? But as much as I like this thing, there's a lot of goof in this episode. First, we're supposed to believe that Tella gets killed by the Zero in that strife and run. But look at how they shot it and tell me it doesn't look like Rodriguez kills her by running her into a tree. She don't have any kind of bullet wound and she makes it all the way to the tree and then keels over. Does the planet still repair you if you get killed by another guest and not one of their things? Well, maybe they can argue that the tree is what killed her and still get that free medical care. And then at the end... No one gives a rat's ass that she's dead. Kirk asks about McCoy. McCoy makes a grand entrance with showgirls and everything. But poor Teller over here got to make a weird Irish entrance back into the scene. And not even Rodriguez seems to be glad that she's still alive. He's just kind of like, oh, hey, you're alive. Good for you. And then you got Barrows over here. She gets sexually assaulted to the point that her uniform is torn to hell. And Kirk, a guy who just saw a guy from his academy days while he was tracking a giant bunny rabbit, has got the balls to ask her if she was just imagining it. And then later, we find out that the planet reads your thoughts and makes them real. So, literally, she was asking for it. Between this and Spock's comment to Rand at the end of Enemy Within, what the heck is going on here? So this ain't a piece of goof, really, just a question I have. Who was thinking of the geese? They explain every single other fantasy robot except the geese. So who thought up the geese? These are important questions. Now here's a legitimate goof right here. Someone beating 
down from the bridge. Trying to. Something's obstructing it. Sulu's line was supposed to be someone's beaming down from the ship, but he said bridge instead, which kind of don't make sense. And no one caught it until post-production, and it was too late to ADR the right line in. Also, it's funny that it's pretty obviously Spock, but they're like, who could this possibly be? Also, this is another situation where we've apparently forgotten we have shuttlecrafts. But I'm not going to call that goof, because the whole power drain thing could be affecting them too. But still, it would have been nice if there was a line in there acknowledging that. I guess the biggest piece of goof, though, is the fact that it takes way too long for Starfleet's cream of the crop over here to put two and two together and figure out what's going on with this planet. And there are times that feel like they figure something out and then forget it in the next scene. It's like we take a step backwards a couple of times and it's weird. Sulu finds a revolver on the ground that's exactly the kind he's been wanting. He don't question it. He don't report it. He just starts blasting. Rodriguez has apparently been telling Teller about World War II fighter planes like a complete weirdo. And then one shows up, on an alien planet no less, and he's just like, Huh, we were just talking about those things. But even Kirk walking into Spock's thing about the cranky crewman at the beginning comes off as strange because he pulls it right after Kirk says he ain't going down for shore leave. Even Geordi LaForge could see that coming. I've said before that I'm not a big fan of a plot depending on the characters being stupid, and this is a textbook example of that. So it's saying a lot that, despite that, I still do really like this episode. Production. Just a couple of things here about the shooting of this episode and why every single fantasy robot comes back except Alice and the Rabbit. Theodore Sturgeon, who was already a big name in science fiction at the time, turned in the script, and Gene thought some of the fantasy stuff, including the Alice and Rabbit thing, was a little too out there for the show, and wrote up a memo asking Gene Kuhn to tone some of that stuff down. Then he went on vacation. Problem is, he left the memo on his desk, and it never got delivered to Kuhn. He got back the day they started shooting, and saw that the memo was still on his desk, next to a copy of the shooting script that still had a giant bunny rabbit in it. So he tears ass out to where they're shooting, but the initial scene had already been shot, so the rabbit's still in the show. But Gene grabbed a legal pad and went and sat under a tree and rewrote the script by hand. Those rewrites had to go back to the studio so they could be typed up and mimeographed, photocopiers weren't really a thing yet, and driven back out, so it was a whole mess. That they managed to actually get the episode completed with all of that going on is pretty impressive. Another fun bit of production trivia, when Shatner found out there was going to be a tiger in the episode, he wanted a scene in there where he wrestled the tiger. Like, for real. No stuntman, no fake tiger. He really wanted to wrestle a real tiger on camera for real. And once the tiger was on set, though, he took one look at how that thing was destroying its lunch and started to have second thoughts. Well, apparently, while the tiger was eating, a grip was walking by and tripped, and the tiger went berserk and tried to pounce on him. It was chained up at the time, but the chain came loose, and everybody freaked out. By the time the handler got a hold of the chain again, Shatner was on top of a big-ass prop box and no longer interested in wrestling anything. When talking about the incident, he said, Instantly, my testicles rose up into my Adam's apple, and the ignorant machismo that had been pulsing so heartily through my veins was replaced by sheer abject terror. I stood there, trying not to look horrified as I gracefully backed down for the good of the show. So it's nice to know he ended up getting real about that. Little did Jeffrey Hunter know how close he came to getting the call back up to the mages that day. But you do notice that later on, the tiger still has the chain around its neck. After that incident, they were no longer interested in letting the chain off, even if the camera could see it. Ruminations Not a lot to ruminate over with this episode. There isn't a clear message per se. We do get the whole, the more complex the mind, the greater the need for the simplicity of play thing. But even this episode doesn't really agree with that since Spock is probably the most complex mind on the ship and he's the one guy that needs to play the least. It's interesting that these guys can repair someone who's been run through with a lance and smacked into a tree, manufacture a friggin' zero or a tiger at a moment's notice, and we don't really hear about them again. There's an animated series episode about it, but it's really just kind of the same story over again. A place that can do all those things, and we just use it as a vacation spot. 
I know the guy says humans ain't ready for their technology, but they seem pretty open to hosting humans at their place, so you'd think we might at least set up a hospital there or something. These guys are really good. It's also interesting that the production of this episode came right after the menagerie, where living in a fantasy world was depicted as an objectively bad thing. The difference, of course, being that shore leave is about living in a fantasy world as a form of vacation and that you end up getting back to the real world, but it's just interesting that we've tackled the subject of fantasy worlds back to back. But all in all, it's a fun episode, a little bit of whimsy and comic relief after some pretty heavy episodes, and we get to see a lot of great character moments. Good stuff. So there you have it, shore leave. What did you guys think of this episode? Was it too goofy? Not goofy enough? Did you kind of want to watch Shatner wrestle that tiger? Well, let me know about it down in the comments. If you enjoyed yourself watching Stuff With Me, let me know by hitting the like button. Really helps out the channel. If you ain't a subscriber, let me invite you to hit that button too so you don't miss any of the excitement of watching Stuff With Me. Possum Rob. If you're in a position to help the channel out monetarily, channel memberships get you early access to the audio commentary tracks I'm doing for The Expanse and Babylon 5. We're having a blast watching those things together over there, so come join the fun. And you get first crack at all of the new stuff I try to do. Emphasis on try. If you're more of a one-time kind of person, hit that thanks button and throw a few quatloos in the tip jar. And we got all the latest possum-related fashion and accessories over at adstudiosmerch.com. T-shirts, coffee mugs, phone cases, you'll love it. You'll look cool and be supporting your favorite possum and all the goofy crap he's doing here. Next time, the Enterprise encounters yet another supreme being, but this one is going to be some serious trouble. Fascinated with both humans and gentlemanly combat, the crew's going to need some luck to survive their encounter with the Squire of Gatos. Until then, possum friends are awesome friends. Take it easy, all right? Later.